views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to Open University from our Bronx East Studios at Mercy College where we keep you in the loop on current discussions in and around the community. I'm your host, Lindsay Violet, and here's what we have on today's show. We'll have a philanthropist and entrepreneur who believes in embedding financial literacy into our youth. Plus, the treasurer of the Belmont District Manager Association will join us for a look at the organization and the exciting things happening in the area. And a young and up-and-coming artist will speak about what inspired him to become the creative professional he is today. So sit back, don't touch that dial, and let me keep you in the loop with a brand new episode of Open University. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Cindy Violet. Our first guest is the founder of the unique nonprofit Exposure Foundation. Let's give him a warm welcome to Raymond Thomas Jr. Thank you. Sorry Thank if you. I pronounce it Raymond. No. Sorry, it's Raymond. Right. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So, can you tell us about the Exposure Foundation? Yes, well, Exposure mm -hmm. Foundation is a 501c3 not for profit whose mission it is to expose children and young people of all ages to the worlds of science, technology, finance, employment slash work ethic, community service, fitness and nutrition, and stronger parent-child partnerships. Now what that does is it allows us to do just about anything that we want to. Okay, so can you tell us how it got started? Well, we're going into our 10th year. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah, we're going into our 10th <laughs> year. Uh, we have 13 programs throughout the uh, Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, Westchester County, and basically got started 10 years ago. I was uh, working uh, No Child Left Behind programs. And one of the things that I noticed is our young people were bubbling in test scores. They weren't learning about real life skills. Mm -hmm. And what I was seeing is young people graduating high school and college, not being prepared for the world of work, not being prepared, prepared for the life ahead of them, mm -hmm. particularly when we talk about financial literacy. So one of the things that I wanted to do is to create uh, an organization that basically looked to teach our young people life skills. Listen, why is it important for you to go to school? So it's important for you to go to school so that you know how to manage your money. One of the things I hated seeing was young people uh, walking into a check cashing store, paying someone else to cash your check for you for money that you work hard for. A lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is I wanted to shift that paradigm and get our young people to understand that you don't pay anyone to cash your check. You work for that money, not the check cashing store. Mm -hmm. And in our inner cities, there's too many check cashing stores and not enough full service banks. So what I wanted to do is to create something, a vehicle where our young people would understand the importance of financial literacy. And that's, I talk about financial literacy and technology and science are all a part of what we do. But for me, the most important component is financial literacy. Because when you talk about economic power, you talk about the base for all power. No, I agree. No, I think you yes. should start that early. Without because there's some, there's some, there's some, a lot of the youth, they don't have anybody telling them how to go about using their money, how to do certain things. So it's exactly. good that you have that. Exactly. So. When you talk about young people, you know, being able to go into a bank and knowing that they have their own account mm -hmm. where they can deposit their own money, you're talking about something that's powerful, something that's long lasting that will be with them for the mm -hmm. rest of their lives. So can you elaborate more on some of the, the courses that you guys offer? Yes. Well, basically what we wanted to do, when you talk about financial literacy, that could be boring if I'm talking to you about interest rates and how banks make their money mm -hmm. and loans and things of that sort, right? But what excites young people? What I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out what excites our young people? What are the things that are going to be long lasting uh, with them? What are they going to remember? All children love movies. All children love music. Yes. All children <laughs> love animations, even adults. Adults mm -hmm. love movies, cartoons, uh, music. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take those pieces and to teach young people music production, to teach young people filmmaking, to teach them the art of 3D and 2D animation, to teach them coding. 
so you just incorporate everything all, all together. Of, all of those things together. Now, <laughs> if I talk to you about teaching them financial literacy, I have the basis to do it with something that they are interested and excited about. I could teach them about fire hydrants and it would be exciting yes. because I'm using <laughs> film, I'm using music, I'm using animation. So that vehicle allows me to teach them just about anything that we want. So that you would say that's one of the methods you use to teach them about how to handling how to handle their money. Without a doubt. I mean, think about it. Dance is also, you know, uh, a part of our offerings. I mean, basically, when you talk about our offerings, you know, even, you know, coding, when you talk about coding. So one of the things that we wanted to do, if I'm talking about uh, teaching young ladies to understand their worth, if mm -hmm. I'm talking to our young people about gun violence, why not create music and song, music videos around those topics? If I'm asking a young person to sit down and, and write something for me about gun violence, they're going to say, I don't want to do that. That's boring. But mm -hmm. if I'm saying to them, create a song about gun it's prevention. It's going to make them, yeah. It's going to be totally a different. Film about it, totally different. I mean, basically what it does is it opens them up. And again, for me, it's three things. Interesting, engaging, and skills rich. If I hit all three of those, I got you're these young there. people. You're, you're in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So can you tell us about um, the non-bullying campaign? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well. One of the things we did years ago, probably about six or seven years ago, is we created uh, our own comic strip. And our own comic strip is The Adventures of Ace in the Fun Finance Crew. And the first uh, comic that we did, and the first film that we did, was called It's a Crime Not to Save. Now here's Ace, this young African-American boy who has a group of multi-ethnic friends. And basically, Ace has the power to daydream. And when he daydreams, everyone around him gets pulled into whatever it is that he's daydreaming about. Mm -hmm. So Ace is a fanatic about saving money. He's a fanatic about doing the right things with your money. So this ep the first episode basically revolved around him becoming a judge and putting his friends on trial for the crime of not saving. Mm -hmm. Move into the second episode. Bullying is a huge problem in our schools, in our communities. And a lot of young people don't even recognize those behaviors because it's something that they've seen, something that they've been exposed to. But when you begin to put it down on a storyboard and they begin to see it illustrated, when they begin to participate and, and write songs about it, what happens is it begins to resonate with them okay. and they begin to identify those behaviors. Mm -hmm. So what happens is now you have a powerful tool to begin talking to them about bullying in a fun, interesting, and engaging way. So, you know, our bullying campaign right now is something called Dear Bully. It's the second episode of the Adventures of Ace and the Fun Finance Crew. It's been this project we've been working on for the last two years, and when okay. we come out with it, it's going to be powerful, <laughs> powerful. I know. I think that's really, really good to, in, you know, engage the, engage the youth in stuff like this because they, you know, for some of them, they don't know. You exactly. know, they don't know. Exactly. And with the, with the program, I think it's really good to have all these different courses because it'll p help them figure out what they want to do in the future. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we were just nominated for an Emmy. Uh, we were nominated for an Emmy in the children youth category for mm -hmm. our financial literacy video. Now, this song, the financial literacy song, is called Work Hard. And it's on our YouTube channel, and basically it's a fantastic video. And, and again, one of our young people wrote it. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they also, because filmmaking is a part of it, they helped you know, put the uh, music video together. And we were nominated for an Emmy Award for it. And, and you know what? And, and I have to go back. Our second year, we were on the cover of Scholastic Magazine nationwide for wow. financial literacy. Uh, which is basically unheard of for a two-year-old not-for-profit. And all we've been doing since is getting our young people to go to banks in all of our programs. Got to get their parents in to open up those custodial savings accounts, um, teaching them about saving their money. We take bank trips probably once every two or three months, depending on the location. And we don't stop there. We begin teaching them about investing. This is great. And not just investing. <laughs> this is really good. Not just investing. We provide them with the seed money to actually purchase shares in Fortune 500 companies. Wow. I have kindergarten and first grade students who own shares, fractional shares of Google, Apple, Disney, and who basically understand the stock market in, for their age, in an age-appropriate way. Yes. You're going to teach a kindergarten or first grade you about know. McDonald's through the logo, right? Yes. Or Disney through the logo. Mm -hmm. 
So those are the ways that we get to our young people. Those are the ways we get to them to understand that they need to be owners, manufacturers, and not just consumers. I really like this. I really love this. <laughs> You're you. teaching them how to become entrepreneurs from a very, very young exactly. age. Exactly. So where can people get more information about Exposure? Well, basically, you can go to our website, which is uh, ExposureSchools.com, and no E at the beginning. We dropped the E at the beginning because we are unique, and we wanted to, I was about that to say, uniqueness you want to, be different. to stand out, right? <laughs> so it's that big X, yeah. ExposureSchools.com, X-P-O-S-U-R-E, Schools.com. And you can also go to our YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash Exposure ENT Network. So that's Exposure ENT Network. And that's from our Zen channel. You're going to be hearing more about Zen because Zen is our you know, music and movie production arm of Exposure that we're working on right now. That's really good. Thank you so much Thank you. for coming today and telling us about these programs. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. <laughs> we have to take a quick break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Open University. Bronx Backyard on Bronx Net. From Broadway in the Bronx. On BronxNet Channel 67 Optimum, 33 Fios, and at www.bronxnet.tv. Featuring Johnny Grave, Johnny Seven, Brooks Thomas, Genetic Control, Ryan Banga. Bronx Backyard on Bronx Live on your channels, BronxNet. Welcome back. Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. was recently joined by the American Planning Association in the Belmont section of the Bronx, declaring Arthur Avenue one of the top streets in the nation. Nancy Asiyama has a story. Known for serving the best Italian foods and products in the Bronx, Arthur Avenue has been named one out of five of the greatest streets in America. It reaffirms to the rest of the, the nation that there's a renaissance, that great things are happening in the Bronx, that we're full of character and culture. We know that the Bronx is you know, the next up and coming place, so we're very excited that we're in on the ground floor of recognizing this as a great place, and I think you know, really it's going to be even greater. According to Marlene Cintron, president of the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, Arthur Avenue has always been the Bronx's biggest kept secret. We've got nowhere to go but up and we've been doing that for the last seven years and we're excited that we're finally getting some, some traction and some attention nationally as well as locally. Although the celebration was public, it was personal for some. John Calvelli, executive vice president of public affairs at the Bronx Zoo, was born and baptized on the nationally recognized street. I think it's really a um, reflection of what this borough is all about. Uh, we are the most ethnically diverse borough um, in the in this city and actually in the country. Business owners on Arthur Avenue say the Bronx has always been great and it's about time the nation gave it some credit. For us, one of the reasons we even opened a bar in the Arthur Avenue section of the Bronx is because we're proud Bronx sites to begin with, and we knew Arthur. We know Arthur Avenue is a neighborhood rich with tradition and culture. That is something that the proud should be pr that the Bronx should be proud of. What happened in all the other boroughs didn't even happen in the Bronx yet. The Bronx is not burning; it's booming. The celebration was open for all, and of course, it would not have been complete without a little taste of Italy. Nancy Asiama, BronxNet. To Arthur Avenue, salute. Thank you, Nancy. Not only is our next guest the treasurer of the Belmont Business Management Association, he is also a father of the outstanding organization. It is my pleasure to welcome Frank J. France for a look at the great work he's doing. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you, Lindsay? Nice thank to be here. You, thank you. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. I know it's a little cold today. <laughs> uh, Winter's got to get here sooner or later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so can you tell us about the Belmont District Management Association? Sure. Um, the Belmont District Management Association is a uh, non-for-profit, public-private partnership, uh, more commonly referred to as a BID, B-I-D, a Business Improvement District, and they mm -hmm. exist in one form or another across the country. In the New York City here, I think there's about 75 or 80 BIDs in various mm -hmm. commercial areas throughout the city that have been started. I think they started back in the late 60s or early 70s. And their main purpose, or their sole purpose by law, is to develop the uh, economic, for economic development in the region which they serve, in our case, 
Arthur Avenue and 187th Street, the Little Italy section of the Bronx. Um, we formed ours, well actually we had a predecessor organization called the Belmont Small Business Association, was uh, created in 97. And that was a uh, private economic development corporation. And once that was taken, as far as we thought it could be, mm -hmm. we explored the possibility of creating a bid to, to replace it, which is what we did. And the bid, I believe, was went into law, I think, 2008, 2009. And, uh, you know, I had the privilege, uh, myself and a good friend and fellow merchant, Peter Madonia, were the founders of the bid. And uh, I was chairman up until uh, last year. I figured it's time to give somebody else a chance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm still on the executive board and very active. And, uh, and actually, Peter Madonia is the current chairman of the bid. And we try and take a very active role in the community. So can you tell, give us a little bit more information about your position and how you got started? Um, uh, well, you know, I, I, I <laughs> because it's an interesting very story. Interesting. Because, uh, right, I, uh, I actually retired young and had a lot of time on my hands. And mm -hmm. that's, for, that's uh, the reason why I think pretty much, you know, I started volunteering in the neighborhood. And uh, when you have a lot of time, you just do more and more. So uh, I'd like to say it was my uh, great business sense, but I think I more or less ended up in the first organization by default because mm -hmm. I, I was the guy that had the time to get involved. But over the last 20 years or so, I mean, it's a real education, uh, something like this, because you can't really learn it in school and how to deal with the city and uh, how to deal with marketing and advertising and security and safety and planning. You know, there's a lot involved and a lot of it's through trial and error. So. Uh, after uh, all these years, I think uh, not just myself, but uh, the crew that we have working on this has gotten quite adept at trying to uh, maximize the potential of the Belmont community. That, that's I, well, we must be doing something right. We just run Best Street in America, right? So can you tell us how um, the, so the organization spreads economic growth f for businesses? Uh, sure. Uh, well, obviously every neighborhood is different. Uh, our community gets most of its business from outside the area. Actually, 83.5% uh, of our business comes from a distance more than five miles away. Mm -hmm. And more than 40% comes from more than 40 miles away. So our neighborhood doesn't act the way a typical neighborhood does serving typically just the residents of their community. Mm -hmm. We more or less fit the model of some type of, uh, of a, like regional outlet mall or shopping center where people will travel there because they perceive some type of value. Of course. Whatever that value is. We like to think it's the quality of our products the uh, good cost of our products and the mm -hmm. variety of them. So that makes yes. it worth coming down. So obviously one main thing we have to do is advertising, marketing, or promotion to keep people coming down and to attract new customers. So we have a, uh, a real online presence. I think we have like a quarter of a million people I was people just gonna ask, how do Facebook. you go about marketing, getting yeah. people to come? And we have you know Twitter and Instagram and our own YouTube channel, but we also advertise on numerous platforms from newspapers and magazines to cable television. We run a lot of different promotions in the community. Just uh, last month, we had Fair Augusto, which our si is our singular biggest activity every year. It's always on the Sunday after Labor Day. And we had like between 24 and 28,000 people down there for the one day. Oh, wow. I mean, that's by far our biggest event, but we have car shows and art shows and uh, uh, health fairs and all types of stuff like that. Now, once we get people there, then we want them to have a nice shopping experience. Now, it's obviously our merchant's responsibility to deliver good products. Of course. But we want to make sure people shop in a clean and safe environment. You know, by that I mean not just physically clean, I mean free of graffiti, uh, streets and, uh, and sidewalks, uh, and good repair, good lighting, uh, you know, et cetera, so that they're happy when they're there. They feel comfortable, they like hanging out, they enjoy their shopping experience. So those are the three main facets that our organization looks like. S uh, safety, sanitation, marketing, and promotion. And we do a lot of little things there also. That, that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Not only does it help the businesses, it makes people feel comfortable. It makes people want to come back. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Because it's not just the products. There's a unique experience in our mm -hmm. neighborhood. I mean, many of the merchants that are there uh, are, are family-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them, you know, if you're there 20 or 30 years, you're the new guy on the block. Most of them are over 50. Many of them are a century old. Same families making products the same way, old-fashioned artisanal methods brought mm -hmm. over from Europe. And, uh, and I think that this honor that we got as Best Treat is a credit to them delivering a good product that they stand by with mm -hmm. their family name for all this time and not turning around and uh, compromising you know, their product for cost mm -hmm. or for volume or uh, anything like that. So it's a, it's a very old world neighborhood. And I think 
you know, New York City at one time was a, a, a city of old world neighborhoods, different mm -hmm. ethnic neighborhoods all over the place. And, you know, in, in more modern times, people travel all over the place and uh, uh, neighborhoods aren't exactly the same anymore. And uh, I, But I think, you know, in a neighborhood, there's more than just a bunch of people living in a neighborhood. A neighborhood is knowing your neighbor, knowing That's your true. neighbor's parents. You know, your parents <laughs> knowing their parents, that type of thing. And that still goes on in our neighborhood. I think regardless of what your ethnic background is, that old feeling sense of community and neighborhood is very alive in our neighborhood. I was going to say, I think that's yeah. why that neighborhood is so successful because, you know, they're still kind of, you know, they're still sticking to their roots. They're still uh, right. sticking yeah. to the... Absolutely. I mean, obviously the us. neighborhood has changed, like everything has changed. Of course, but there's still, but they still uh, there's have a, a feeling of pride exactly. in the community among everyone that lives there, not mm -hmm. just the Italians that live there, but among mm -hmm. everybody. And uh, we all recognize that we're part of the same community and we all work for the betterment of it and that's what keeps us there. You know, we, we, we flourished back in the heyday of the Bronx, and uh, we were there during all the worst days of the Bronx, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and now the Bronx is uh, experiencing a, a renaissance that is, you know, rapidly growing, and mm -hmm. we're taking part in that also. So I see a, a good future, mm -hmm. you know, so for what, Italy. So what does this mean for a little I Italy, for Arthur Ave, to be the greatest street on America, in America? Well, you know, obviously, it's a, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a great compliment to us, and we take mm -hmm. it that way, everybody who's part of that community. Uh, it's also getting us a lot of, uh, a lot of TV time and marketing <laughs> and promotion, so hopefully more people will, uh, will come and visit us, mm -hmm. uh, which will be good for business and, uh, and something else, you know, another part of, uh, of, uh, of the Bronx, you know, something else to come down to the Bronx for in addition to, you know, the uh, Bronx Zoo, which is only a few blocks mm -hmm. from us, or the Botanical Gardens, again, a few blocks from us. We're right next to Fordham University in a 10-minute mm -hmm. cab ride to Yankee Stadium. So if you're coming for any of those things, stop and have a, a meal in Belmont yes, or I need, buy some I pastry need to, to take I, home. I, I need to go. I need to come. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the plans for the in the future for BDMA? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we're going to probably continue doing the same thing that we are doing now. Uh, I mean, as long as the uh, merchants are there and thriving, obviously they got to do their job providing mm -hmm. good product. We'll be promoting them, and uh, I don't see any changes, uh, big changes. What we've been doing over the last five, ten years seems to have been working. Uh, we do try a few new things every year. You mm -hmm. know, uh, we're very lucky. A lot of neighborhoods, a lot of businesses, a lot of organizations look for that, you know, like for, for that good idea. Mm -hmm. We have so many opportunities and so many good ideas there. This, this happens at all our meetings. We have 20 new ideas, and we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a blessing. So <laughs> no, we, we're it. always it looking to, to, you know, to increase what works well. And if something's not working as well, even if it's working but not as well, you know, we get rid of it. We try something new. So there's always fine-tuning going along. But, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, I think we got a, uh, a formula that's working pretty well right now. That's good. So where can people go to get more information? Uh, the best thing is probably to go on our website, which is BronxLittleItaly.com. You'll find out what's going on in the neighborhood, and from there you'll be directed to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that other stuff I mentioned before if you want to get involved in that. But there's always up-to-date information as to what's happening in the neighborhood. There's a merchant directory, and uh, there's uh, tons of photo galleries of all those activities I told mm -hmm. you that was going on in the neighborhood. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and just various other things of concern to the Bronx community. So uh, that's where I would go, absolutely. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. We have to take a quick break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Open University. If you want to stay in the know about the latest happenings in Espanol, check out Dialogo Abierto, BronxNet's own Spanish show, Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. on Channel 67. The latest in news, arts, culture, politics, and what's going on in your neighborhood. Dialogo Abierto, the best way to stay connected in Spanish. See you there. Te esperamos. Welcome back to the studio. Here to join us today is a high-reaching artist who has a special taste for realism art. Welcome, Kalik Dash. Thank you. Thank you for coming here today. My pleasure. Okay, so you're an artist and you're from Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn too. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so can you tell us like what influenced um, your art, uh, your painting? Probably most likely trying to be different from the normal crowd, mm -hmm. which was mainly sports. A lot of people are into sports, but not a lot of people were oriented into art. Okay. So can you tell us like, tell us more about your paintings? Tell us like 
what do you look for when you paint? Like what, elaborate more, like what influences you to paint? Like what do you look for when you paint? Um, usually it's just a spark of idea, curiosity, anything that's abstract and abnormal, things you probably wouldn't think of or see. Mm -hmm. So are you into using different colors? I know some some painters like to stick to certain colors when they're telling a certain story. Do you mm. feel like you're telling a story with your painting? Um, I don't like to use really much colors. Okay. I find colors like bright and usually obtuse and annoying. So I try to stay monochromatic, mm -hmm. usually on a scale of black and gray. Mm -hmm. Just to try to use more of that than bright colors to over consume the painting. So most of my art would be either with charcoal or pencil. Okay, so what do you look for for inspiration when it, when you, you know, uh, <laughs> when you're uh, about to paint? Well, uh, it would depend on the mood or the time of day. Like if it's a bright sunny day, I would look for things that stand out. So if there's one person that's depressed, well, why are they depressed? Mm -hmm. Try to make a backstory for that and then use that to create art. Okay, do you have like any like story for us where like you've had an experience and you know you were able to show it through your art? Um, any special story? Uh, well, there's one, but it's not like really happy tone. Mm -hmm. It was like one time when I was at Coney Island, I didn't know how to swim at the time. So mm -hmm. I was like a fish out of water, so I was drowning. So that created one painting that I did with a boat that looks as though that it's above the surface, but it's actually being swallowed. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us um, who hasn't, like, can you, do you have like a famous, um, famous painter that you look up to or anything of that sort? Uh, it would have to be Hayao Miyazaki, okay. just because he doesn't use main protagonists being males. He often uses young females to drive a story, and that's what I find really creative, because he, he tries to look for the abnormal instead of the most popular in genre. Mm -hmm. So where can people go if they want to look at your artwork? Well, I have a Facebook and an Instagram that I use mostly, but I tell also have a Twitter. Tell everybody. Oh, well, <laughs> my you can look into that camera. Oh, and tell well, everybody. my Instagram is high pocket underscore art, and my Facebook is just my name, Kylie Drummond Dash, and I mainly post on Instagram more than I do on Facebook. On Facebook, because Facebook is more for family and friends. Yeah. So, do you, what are your goals for the future? Uh, mainly to get into a college that just focuses on art and doesn't treat it as a subclass but mostly a major or just a school in general that treats it with more light that it should have. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, thank you for coming today. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you for telling us about your artwork. Um, that's it for our show today. Thank you to our guests for joining us and you, the viewer, for tuning in. We hope that we kept you in the loop on everything that is happening in and around our borough. I'm Lindsay Violet. Until next time. Also, remember to do as you can, give as you can, and love as you can. <laughs>